All right. Welcome back to a massive day here on Friends from Work, a podcast about all things in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And it's a podcast that's hosted by myself, Kyle Sconowell, and my longtime friend from work, Robbie Earl. Robbie, the weather is finally turning a little bit cooler over here in Nashville for the first time in what feels like seven months. Um, and so with fall on the horizon, I thought of something today. It's time to remind people of our great fall merchandise selection. And so let me just quick oh, take you yeah. through a couple of okay. friends from work items here. Just in case, you know, you're thinking I need to get some hot cocoa going. I need to sit by a fire. Well, why not yeah. sit by a fire with this beautiful friends from work beanie, first of all. I mean, yeah. a beanie that works for all seasons. In about two weeks, I'm going to start wearing this instead of a hat. Okay. Yep. Uh, look at that. It's got the TVA style friends from work. Subtle. Mm -hmm. If you know, you know. If you don't know, it just looks dope. Mm -hmm. That's item number one. Get yours right now. The FFWpodcast.com. This is like an infomercial. Number two. This <laughs> works for is, both seasons. That Go beanie is, is one of the one of my favorite things that we've ever made. And I, I still have like 50 of them in this closet behind me. So let's get rid of them. Yeah, uh, come on. Check this out. And it's, it's kind of Deadpool Wolverine themed as well. So you love to see it. Uh, how about you get yourself a massive, really sharp looking, look at this, well packaged friends yep. from work tumbler, the yep. classic logo. Look at that metal exposed. I mean, this thing's massive. Put your warm drink in here. Put your cold drink in here. It yeah. works for both seasons. So, so, I mean, right now you could get this exact one, although wow. I'll put it back in the box nicely. So that Tumblr, <laughs> the FFWpodcast.com. And lastly, I don't have many of these left, but speaking of the Deadpool theme, Ooh, it's getting cold yeah. outside. Get your hoodie on. Yeah. Why don't you get this? Why don't you get your friends from work hoodie? Look at this. Okay, I can't hold it very well, but look at that. <laughs> Designed by our friend Jacoby Warlick. Yeah. Got the dope. Look at that Loki. Uh, got the Loki helmet on there. Got the FFW logo on there. And then the TVA, you know, lines from the computer, the timelines. Incredible. Yeah. So all those items and more, including the shirt I'm wearing, available at the FFWpodcast.com slash shop. But you can also just explore the website there. That's what I wanted to start today with. Happy fall to all who celebrate. It is, uh, you know, per usual, I, we're going to be on a bit of a delay in Austin when it comes to yeah, getting right. colder. But fall it, doesn't exist there, so yeah, it's it is uh, because it, it kind of got rainy yesterday. Uh, it the temperature dropped, and I think it's going to stay with highs like below ninety for a bit, which is pretty nice. There you go. Uh, what, what great fall weather! Put your right? hoodie on. <laughs> we. In fairness, the actual temperatures have not been too bad uh, this year, especially the last couple of weeks. But the heat index has been consistently above 100, which is just not not what you want to see come not October. Ideal. Okay, so today is a massive day because since we recorded our last episode, they officially dropped a full-blown Thunderbolts asterisk TM Uh trailer. And mm -hmm. I want to start with that. And then we got to talk about Agatha episode three for people who are just shutting it off right now as you speak. Um, as I speak. Mm -hmm. Dude, the trailer. So I had seen a little bit of a leaked version of this trailer from the D23 Expo thing. Uh -huh. And it's interesting because this was recut a little bit. There was some stuff different. I don't know about you. I feel like the trailer game has been really strong. I would say yeah. for both Thunderbolts and Captain America, I'm yeah. I was like here, now I'm here. The Florence I don't know why, but to me just leaning into Florence Pugh being depressed is incredible. And you answer that while I shut off my air conditioning cuz I forgot to do that. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Well, I think what I what I really like is Florence and Yelena stepping in for Natasha. Like, I, I think this idea mm. that she is kind of like, she's carry. I, we saw that in Hawkeye and I thought that that was handled really well. Some of my favorite moments were her and Clint kind of processing the loss of Natasha together. Uh, and so I, I like that 
she is, you know, we haven't seen her since then. And she was pretty shaken at the end of that show. And I like that she kind of seems to be in that spot still where it's like she's, you understand like why she wound up doing what she was doing in Hawkeye, which was one of my questions then. Like, why is she suddenly kind of moving back into assassin mode? But you get like that line in the trailer where she's like basically been trying to throw herself back into these old rhythms and it's not really working. And like, yeah, I, I think you're right. Like the depression element there works in, in a way that I think goes beyond the post end game. Yes. Depression or, or fallout that we've dealt right. It's with a, a different, lot. it's a different kind of depressed. I love how it kind of ties into the same theme from multiverse of madness. It's this idea of, are you happy? And mm-hmm. for some reason, I, th- <clears throat> I think that's genius writing to be exploring. Yes. Not the, the post end game thing was genius because it was, man, we lost all these people. That was a really tough time. Wow. Right. But now, we've gotten far enough away that I love thinking about what would these superheroes who have to just go back to regular life? Like there Mm -hmm. isn't an Avengers team. You're not just daily doing missions. Yes. You're on call, but like theoretically you're on call from somebody. Yeah. But the question of, do you feel fulfilled or are you happy to me is such a beautiful, like phase five thing to be exploring because Uh it's also kind of like, what what do they do? What is their purpose? What is Dr. Like if Dr. Strange doesn't find purpose in his job or he doesn't find purpose in marrying Christine, like w- where is he finding this purpose? Yeah. Same thing here. And I love the idea that she's struggling with that. And I think it's actually going to give them, I mean, unique storylines, yeah. unique plots to, to explore yeah. and potentially depending on how it's handled, like, that perfect balance of humor and fun and cool action mixed with actually like a deeper theme that the main character is wrestling with and actually something you can take away as a viewer. Yeah, no, I think that's well said. One thing that I really appreciated about the trailer is, you know, I I feel like there I've seen chatter about this movie just being like a knockoff Suicide Squad. And oh, which is one of the worst movies ever. Sorry, the original one's one of the worst right, movies right, ever. Right, right, uh, right. And I I assume, maybe I'm being charitable, I assume people are comparing it to the gun version. But even then, I think what I really appreciate about this is, like, Suicide Squad is really leaning into these are villains. Like, they, yeah. they are doing this because they have to do this. That's, like, kind of the fun element. Whereas, like, I like that they are, like, if you look at the characters that are being included here, it makes sense that, it makes sense that they would all be on the same page because to varying degrees, they yeah. all like view themselves as heroes, as good heroes. people. Like they're yeah, trying they to do are, the right thing. They all are good people to some extent. Like, uh, Yelena's character was somewhat redeemed. Even Ghost was somewhat redeemed, or at least yeah. forgiven at the end of that movie. Yeah. And then Bucky's uh, inclusion in this is fascinating because yeah. Bucky was a straight villain, has rehabbed entirely out of it. Yeah. Like, we haven't seen Bucky in Winter Soldier mode. So in the trailer, when he's stopping them, that's fascinating. Like, why would Bucky yeah. want to stop them? He's not a part of that team. Is he... Does he see what they're doing and say, that's crossing the line for me? I mean, I could see, I mean, that, that's one thing that I liked a lot about Bucky in Falcon Winter Soldier, where it's like this. I think a, a lot of his problem with John Walker there is that it's such a, like, even beyond the Steve Rogers of it all, it's such a sore spot for him what was done to him kind of using the super soldier serum. And it's like the destructive capability of that within sort of like a quasi military apparatus. And it's like, I could, I could see him just seeing this collection of people, even Yelena, who I think has so much in common with Bucky. And I think that's fascinating because they were both essentially forced to do things that, that they weren't choosing to do to do like it was like they were watching themselves carry out these like atrocities Mm -hmm. so i feel like there was something there i mean even with like uh with david harbour's character um gosh uh 
uh, uh, Red Guardian. Red Guardian, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, where it's like, you know, I feel like there's some fun history to explore there probably between him and Bucky. Like, we know that Bucky and um, Isaiah had run-ins. So I think it makes sense that he probably would have had run-ins with Red Guardian as well during like a similar era. But I, I, I really like, like there's so much potential. Yes. And, and there's some interesting stuff because like on the one hand you, you have like you have Bucky and Yelena who I think they like, they're just legitimately, they're primarily uh, like well-intentioned. Like, I think most of the stuff that they've done, other than Yelena, like, trying to kill Clint, has been, like, good when they were able to do it and bad whenever they were under the control of somebody else. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, you have, like, Ghost and John Walker, who they chose to do the things that they did, but they feel as though they were justified in doing so. And that's, yes. like, a whole different motivation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, like... It, I don't it, know. I, I really like the combination of characters there. For sure. And that's why my brain never really went to Suicide Squad. Now, side note, I do hate when people say the whole like, like I have a lot of friends who be like, oh, this is way different than this thing. And this is why it's better when really they're exactly the same. Like he'll be like, yeah. you know, and so I hate that as a defense always of something. However, my brain didn't go to Suicide Squad with this because of those reasons. Like that has such a different tone. If I remember right, they're like under threat of death, right? Yeah. yeah they're it's going like, to die. They're all they awful pull a, people. Press a button and like and their head them explodes. up or something. Yeah. Right. So like they're bad people who are under threat of death, who have to come together. And then it still has like the James Gunn, like goofy tone, the, the, um, the spotted dude and like giant yeah, yeah. creatures at the end. Uh -huh. Whereas this doesn't feel like that's what they're exploring at all. So like tonally, it also doesn't feel the same. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, to your point, like these are like, these are misunderstood heroes, not yeah. straight bad guys. And then exploring with a, exploring like a more emotional side of it than just do this or you'll die from the government kind of thing. And I'm not belittling Suicide Squad. I just think it's a little bit of a different yeah. vibe they're even trying oh, totally. to approach. And I love the tone that's set here in this trailer. Like something about yeah. starting it. Like this is what I love about these movies. The DoorDash thing is funny. Yeah, yeah. Somehow it's funny. And yet <laughs> yeah. the tone of the trailer is immediately like way deeper. That's what yeah. Marvel's so good at. Like it, it's not a comedy, but it's funny. But like I'm left feeling a little bit conflicted. Yeah. I want to also just talk about too really quick. Or do you oh, want to yeah. say something to that first? No, go ahead. I'm gonna change subjects. Oh well, yeah. I was all like, there is just there are so many things about this movie that I'm excited about, and yes, we don't that's have to talk about them all now. But but it's like I we love, do have to talk about some of them. Well, I love the character designs too. Like mm -hmm. everyone looks dope in this ghost trailer. looks unbelievable it's yeah. so good that there are people online mad at peyton reed for what ghost <laughs> used to look like but yes ghost looks so cool yeah like and taskmaster I, who always looked cool but yes but yeah and yelena looks great like everyone everyone's just like dude i have full-blown chills right now yelena yelena with the natasha throwback haircut yeah like intentionally yeah. doing that like her shooting the two dudes in in this like it just has uh -huh. like such a badassery feel i'm i'm, and I'm all in I love the setup here where none of them are really like, you know, I, I guess Ghost would be the only one that you would view as like straight super powered. I mean, John Walker as well, but kind of in the same way that Steve Rogers was, where he's kind of supposed to be the normalish person. Uh, and then obviously Elena is kind of in the same boat as Natasha. So I like one that they've got the kind of like, Avengers stand-ins, which I want to come back to in a second. Yeah. But I also like that, like the the way they're setting this up where they're all being sent ostensibly to take out Bob, who is the sentry in the in the comics, I think is really interesting because he's basically this kind of like Superman type character that is like virtually unstoppable whenever he is in play. And I like that you've got this team of like really well trained, but fundamentally kind of like outclassed people going up against a person like that. Like, I just think that there's an interesting, like, there's a, a, a dynamic there that I'm not really sure we've seen explored 
And I think that that's going to give you the opportunity to, you know, even in the trailer, when you're introduced to this version of the character of Bob, it's like, you can already tell it's going to create this tension of like, do we do the thing that like, do we make the hard but necessary choice and like try to take this person out because he's crazy dangerous and can't really be trusted? Or do we like lean into like the, the better angels, which I would imagine is where like Bucky would want to pull things and trust him and give him the benefit of the doubt. And like, I, I, that's something that I think is is very different than than what Gunn was doing in Suicide Squad. I'm just realizing this might be the most info or takes I've ever gleaned from a single trailer since we've been doing this podcast. Like, I because I have like ten more yeah. things I want to get into. Yeah. So you're right in all that. I think we have to take a second to talk about just the visual aspect of the trailer and the like the color grading. Mm-hmm. I think. A lot of the MCU has looked great. And I'm not one of these guys that in general criticizes everything they do. There are some of those people online. Right. Uh, But there was something to the film work, the color grading here that had such a tangible, realistic feel. And Mm -hmm. I looked into it. Yeah, they did go to Utah and film for a month. They did blow up cars. So like when that car flips over, that's a real thing in Utah. And there is something... Okay, again, don't jump on me for this. It has a little bit of an Eternals feel visually, which I think is a huge win. Because they actually went there and did it. And it's not all on a soundstage. I even thought like like the cinematography of just like the Marvel Studios logo going up and getting a, a silhouetted uh, yeah. Florence Pugh, her fighting through that hallway, the the Avengers Tower revealed, uh-huh. like those doors opening felt so tangible and beautiful. Oh, man, like yeah. it feels like a real skyscraper in that movie. It doesn't feel like you edited it into New York. Something about the way they did it. Yeah. I know that's way too much to get excited about a single no, trailer. No, I think it does feel Even tangible. The, the the Red Guardian, this is so stupid, but like the DoorDash, they feels like they found an old house, yeah. threw a bunch of junk in it, and went and filmed in it. Versus yeah. like Miss Marvel feeling like, okay, this is still on a soundstage. Yeah. That's yeah. what I mean. Like this was a this isn't a house yeah. where they just took a camera. And I love it so much. Like I almost wish they would lean into this for everything. Mm-hmm. Like there's some stuff that I think is just a truth they should go like go down this path some things i get stylistically wouldn't work as well but like that's one critique i've always had miss marvel like i want it to feel like such a real house and it does inside but then they go on that roof and i'm like why couldn't you have just found a real roof to go on kind of thing yeah that is the like that is one of the things that i would love to see and we talked about this recently but like when we talk about the vibe that we're looking for for this next spider-man movie like yes. that, I, I that's it needs what to I look want. like this trailer. It needs to yeah. look like this trailer. Yeah. When he's swinging, I need to see see that you like took a camera through New York like this. Yeah, you know, like that's what I want. Um, who's directing this? I should know that. I'm blanking because obviously I need to start looking into is this just a new vibe from the top or is this a director cinematographer thing where they're just passionate about this? Um, why are you researching that? Schreier. Sh- that sounds I right. Think? That sounds right. Yep. I uh what else has he I done? am not I'm not familiar with I don't think any of these. It's like the Charles Barkley meme. I'm sorry. Or the the uh, uh, um the Shaq meme. I was not familiar with your work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you your know game. what? It's I I did know this. Uh he is the uh the director, I think the primary director behind Beef, which is a show that I have not seen and I'm kind of ashamed of having not seen it because I've heard it is I've heard it's incredible. Uh, I also think that that's why originally uh, they had, gosh, I'm like terrible with. Uh, well, with this is fascinating. Today. This is um, them going back to their roots of finding awesome yeah. indie directors that don't have uh, a huge oh, catalog. Yeah, Stephen Yoon was originally uh, supposed to be Century in this, who is the main, uh, oh, one yeah, of yeah, the main yeah. characters in Beef, also voices uh, Mark Grayson and in Invincible. Um, but, but yeah, I always want to call him Glenn cause I think that was his character name in the walking dead. But yeah, so I, I think that th- like, that's, I think what that director is primarily associated with. 
Okay, well, I'm I'm so stoked for that aspect of it too. I'm hoping that visually and action wise, like it lives up to what this trailer is setting. And I know it's really subtle, but I think if you watch the trailer again, there's really tangible differences between that and some of the other films in this uh, MCU. Mm -hmm. And this is like my scene. Like this is the route I want you to go in general. Yeah. Um, the last Dude, thing how I'll about say, the 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 Bucky. Like the using the same, like the same gun. The disc uh, thing. Yeah. Which I think, if I remember right, Taskmaster also uses something similar. Oh, that's similar. right. Yeah. I mean, I know he has the bow, uh, or she has the bow. Um, I think there is something like that. But yeah. yeah it's I, And I thought about that here with Vibe because it does feel like there's such a through line from like Winter Soldier to Civil War to Black Widow to Thunderbolts in a way that like, and Brave New World may fit in there as well. Although I feel like that movie's doing something a little bit different with the the leader and the Red Hulk. But that that's kind of the last variable for me. Like we're in the middle of Agatha, which is a variable, like unsure yeah. how it's going to land. And then the next project is like, we'll see how Captain America is. And the trailer gets me really excited, has potential, could also be a little bit of a miss. I, I just don't think this or Fantastic Four, I don't know. Yeah, I'll be. I think these seem like hits to me, and I, I think Captain America could be too. But that's the question mark for me. Yeah, yeah. I, and, I oh, have, and Daredevil, and Daredevil will be a massive oh, smash. Man. There's no yeah. way Daredevil. And not you good. know what I love is that, like, you know, again, we're. I think next year is just going to be really fun because it's going to be so much fun for so many reasons. <clears throat> like uh, the first three projects, I think all could all depending on how they're executed, fall in that sort of like classic more grounded feeling mcu that we talk about a lot like the, oh, for sure the thing that i think the winter soldier exemplifies and so that i love that it like, will i think well i think you know like brave new world is the one that i'm curious to see red like, hulk yeah because there's also like the the eternals uh like a uh, celestial shot and stuff and so i'm not sure how much they're wanting to do there but i do think it's going to be fundamentally kind of political thriller and I love that, like, th I think Daredevil Born Again will be because of the kind of mayoral campaign element. Uh, and, and Benson and Moorhead directing yeah, that. Don't forget man. that. So, but what I love is that, like, what I've been the most excited about for next year has been Fantastic Four. And then Daredevil is kind of like right there. But now, like, I, what I love is that we're getting these three projects that I'm getting more and more excited about. I've always been excited about Daredevil, but Thunderbolts and Captain America that are doing something that's more grounded. And then we're getting this Fantastic Four movie that's such the opposite that is going to do the kind of like fun sci-fi with like the Matt Shackman kind of like, I think, wink at the camera twist. Hopeful, yeah. And so I love that we are, like that we're getting both next year because I think that all of the signs are pointing to both being so great. And so it's like if there's, if you're wanting one category over the other, I think either way you're going to be happy. Mm -hmm. But I think that like people that are just longtime MCU fans, especially people that kind of came in as as the Russos were really starting to make their mark, I think are definitely going to be eating well. I, I think as fans and as podcast hosts, we've legitimately spent over a year, maybe I would say two years, kind of in a weird season to be podcasting for the Marvel Cinematic Universe because yep. two years ago was just kind of universally not liked as much. We liked a lot of the stuff, but in general, the vibe just got less good. And then this year has been almost just no content. Like they've adjusted, they've taken a break. And yeah. like you saw the hype around Deadpool and Wolverine, what it could look like. I and genuinely, so I genuinely mean this when I say I am so ecstatic for a new year and yeah. the projects that are coming and what this new kind of phase of, of Marvel could look like from also a podcasting standpoint. Like if yeah. you enjoyed our podcast this year, <laughs> I think next year is going to be so fun with the opportunities that listeners will have, but that we'll have too. Like, yeah, I mean, even as dumb as you and I planning to see Captain America in Atlanta and go do a, a retreat where we like just get, you know, just yeah. like, like yeah. next year could be really fun on a podcast standpoint. Okay. We have so much to get into. I, I have, have one more thing about the trailer. 
I know. I have I have two more things about the trailer. Okay, <laughs> I'm okay. done. Then I'm done. But you can okay. go first. Well, just I want to talk about the Avengers Towerness of it. Okay, that, that's one of my things. So we okay, only have well, two that things. Well, Val now. purchased it, and then the asterisks in the name. And I just had read this theory, and I don't know if it's true, but that the asterisks in the name is actually because they're going to change the title. Have I you heard think this that theory? that's true. No, well, I I don't I haven't heard the theory, but that's kind of my theory as 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 Which well. Which would I think would be awesome. Yeah. Um, like that they never clarify why they're calling it that, but there's a rumor that it's going to be called dark Avengers and, um, that that's yeah. going to be said, like those terms will be said in captain America. And so that's they're waiting I, for captain America to then change the title, yeah. which I have chills. I don't know why that's just kind of fun to me. I don't I know mean, why well, I no. I think that it's so fun. And it's like, I, I think the, it's hard because like Thunderbolts is really like in the comics, like that is the seed that that kind of grows into Dark Avengers. So I don't like there are people listening that will say that I, I shouldn't like bulldoze over Thunderbolts and, and the way it was originally conceived. And However, I'm not against the title staying that, by the way. Oh, no, 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 no. But but I do think that like I I found the Dark Avengers story to be so compelling and we've talked about it a lot because there's just, there's so much you can do. Like Thunderbolts, the way it is in the comics actually is a lot like Suicide Squad. Like the whole thing is they are villains and okay. they're kind of like tricking people into thinking that they're heroes, but they actually are villains. And that element is in Dark Avengers. But I think what makes it interesting there is like they are actually, they move into Avengers Tower Norman Osborn and that comic like basically takes over for Tony Stark and it's like they it really is this almost cosplaying as the Avengers like you have in that universe the Venom like er, Venom like changes the suit to look like Spider-Man and you have like Bullseye turning into Hawkeye like stuff that we've talked about before but so whenever I see like that you but have a Captain they, America are they doing bad stuff like evil in Dark stuff? Avengers they are they are so like they are they are bad guys that the real avengers would have to stop but and at the because at the time this is like uh in that civil war era in the comics so at the time like the actual avengers are kind of like outlaws and so these are supposed to be like the government sanctioned avengers but I, it's complicated because there are certain characters that don't understand what's going on so like they are act they they do think that they're doing the right thing and they're kind of being misled and I think that that's where like Val can come in here as the stand-in for Norman Osborn and kind of like manipulating these various characters into doing what she's wanting them to do. And I do like I like I, it makes so much sense to me because there's this void that's been there since Endgame, where it's like we've heard people ask in multiple projects, like where are the Avengers? Are the Avengers? Who are what the are Avengers? They doing? Yeah, like so you can imagine this. Like there's this famous shot from uh the it's the end of the secret invasion comic i think and also kind of the start of the dark avengers comic where it like shows the announcement of like these are the new avengers and it's like norman osborne and his iron patriot armor and like all of these kind of villains that he's trying to pass as and like i could totally imagine just something kind of like the scene we got in falcon winter soldier where they're announcing john walker as captain america but as like a whole new team of Avengers. And I like I, that to me, it fits. It makes sense. It creates some really interesting tension. I think it creates some like interesting opportunities. This is like my last point with uh, Captain America because like there are so many ingredients that overlap between those. Like both of these series seem to be pulling pretty heavily from Falcon Winter Soldier. And one, I texted you and Pete, like, I love that because that's a project that is not like hated, but not well loved by very many MCU fans. Like, I think most people saw it as kind of like just a, a meh offering. Mm -hmm. So I love that they are again trying to redeem something and like retroactively infuse it with more purpose versus and by throwing the way, it away. They're doing that, like, if you look at, Greg pointed this out, but if you look at where each of these characters are coming from, that's almost like, 
like Ant Man, the Wasp, Black Widow, Falcon, Winter Soldier. Yeah. It stuff that people, to varying degrees, have kind of written off, and so I think that like they're leaning into that for the movie. But I am curious, like where Sam is going to fit into this, and how like if if we see him kind of working with the government in Brave New World. Like, is something that goes on with him and Ross there, like, is that going to to somehow set the stage for Thunderbolts? And where is Sam Wilson going to be during this entire movie? And, like, if, you know, are, are he and Bucky going to be in communication? Is he going to be, like, driven underground or something or somehow taken off the map? Like, I, I think there's just really interesting stuff that you can do with the pairing of those two back to back that like, I'm not sure we've ever really, depending on how they utilize it. I don't know that we've ever really seen something like that. I'm like not, where it's and, like, it, yeah. You know, and could, if, is that maybe why Bucky is trying to stop him? And, and if, if, if they are a dark Avengers team and they're doing bad stuff, yeah. Does Bucky tell Sam? Does, does Sam tell Dr. Strange? Does Dr. Strange tell Spider-Man? Yeah. Man, and that's, Hulk? yeah, that's like, I mean, I, I'm so curious to see, like, one of the, the not missed opportunities, uh, but, you know, we've talked about how that kind of Civil War era, they, they had to get pretty quickly into Infinity War. And so you weren't able to do a ton with this idea of Captain America and Sam and Natasha on the run. I'm wondering if they're going to try to kind of recreate that a bit here. And like, maybe that's where we, we like go back to secret invasion also, we, you know, cause we talked about that kind of like that series ending with this like stoking of fears uh, and seemingly like that being directed, not just at aliens necessarily, but it like maybe at all of the, like all of the super people that have kind of like brought all of this trouble to to earth from certain people's perspective. I don't know. And I, I, they'd have to be doing a lot of it in the shadows too, because right when I tossed that out, I was thinking, well, like, I don't know how much contact Bruce, for example, has with the government anymore. Like Dr. Strange. Yeah. Like meaning like, how could they pull this off? Because if Dr. Strange and or Bruce decide to stop this team, they could. That's I thought. That's what I thought to myself when I said that. I was like, well, they could just go in and physically overpower them. But then I thought, like, yeah, if the Avengers team is so broken up that they're just not even in con- – like, they may not even know. Like, right. Bru- Bruce may be on his island or whatever, just, like, doing other work. But he's not, like, calling the government, as far as we've seen, every second. Um, even, like, Shuri in Wakanda. Like, I don't know how connected she is to yeah. what's happening in New York. Well, like, and also – I think that there's the uh, like the the tension there that I really love is it's kind of like the, the like the dark night uh you know where it's like you with all your strength like you have nothing because I I like this idea that yeah the Hulk could go in or Doctor Strange could go in and take all of these people out but if they're not criminals like if they're actually sanctioned by the government and this is something that then is, you'll be the criminal for right, doing it like you can't, I, yeah, you're, you're now no longer like superheroing. You're like you're just doing what you think is right and going against what everybody else is, is thinking. And so like, there's that, but also on the power side, like, that's why I think the century element is, well, maybe they recruit century. It, well, like, maybe Val like, sends them to stop them. And then it turns into, you know, I mean, that's a us. huge part of dark Avengers is, is like basically Norman figures out how to, manipulate Sentry into thinking that like he wants what's best for him and he's the only guy that he can trust and then he kind of becomes his like secret weapon because there actually is there's not really anybody in the Marvel Universe at least at that time in the comics that could really beat Sentry like he like it becomes like a new civil war but between those two like yeah like Oh, <laughs> well, because he's also like the big thing about that character is he's very like mentally unstable. And so that's why it like freaks people out. And that's why it's oh. like Norman's the only one that has figured out kind of how to put him on a leash. And so everyone's terrified that if 
if things break bad, like again, there's no one. Like I think the idea is they they got to get Vision back. Yeah, yeah, man. It's so then I, it becomes just, like Vision and Sentry, and then Doctor Strange and Wanda and Hulk on one side, then Sentry and John Walker yeah. and Ghost and Taskmaster, and on the other side, kind of thing. Man, and that's Red Red Hulk, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like oh. That would be, so it's like it's civil war, but with their counterparts. Yeah, which Vision I think and would Century. be more interesting. Hulk and Red Hulk, especially if like, especially if you have people on the right side of things, Daredevil that are not, and uh, Florence Pugh, Yelena, maybe. Well, I'm and to think of, uh, we are Spider Man and Venom. <laughs> Bullseye is returning in uh, Born Again, right? Didn't we get confirmation? Bullseye and Hawkeye. Or Kate Bishop, one of the two. Yeah, yeah, man. That yeah, that's the other thing. Is like, where does the Young Avengers stuff fit in all this? Uh, if, if anywhere, you know, I don't know if that's something where, based on just the Marvels not really getting any traction, like if that's something that's going to kind of be like put on hold for a second. I don't think that they won't follow up on it because that's just not that's not in their the, DNA. But man, I like there are. That's what I'm saying. Like, I would I would really recommend people go check out the if, if you're a comics reader the dark avengers series i'm actually checking it is available on organic price books right now and it's uh and, and by the way organic price books the guy from organic Pri price books jp great dude the message man. us that there's like a an overstock they're they're doing an even larger discount right now something yeah. right 25 percent off more yeah or something. If, uh, if you go to their website, uh, in addition to, you know, there's, we've talked about the friends from work recommends tab and, uh, I need to, I need to update that soon with all of these new projects coming out and I'll make sure we put dark Avengers and all the stuff in there to kind of simplify it for folks. But if you go to the distribution overstock sale, I think for the next 30 days, little under 30 days, yeah, there are even bigger discounts on these books. And some of them are paperbacks. I'm, I'm scrolling through now. Some are uh, omnis, some are just hardcovers. And so kind of whatever price point you are looking at, this will almost certainly take any of these books below what you would be able to get them for on Amazon. That's anyway. the thing. It's the cheapest possible. Yeah, exactly. But there are a couple things that I just scrolling through, I want to shout out based on this conversation and then I'll all shut up on the comics front, but there is that Dark Avengers book. Mm -hmm. There's also the Captain America by uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, which is, I think, likely to to be adapted at least a little bit in this coming uh, Captain America film. There's also um, a uh, you can get the the second part of the Avengers run that we're covering on Friends from Work Plus. That uh, that Omni is on organic price books in that discount section. So that Now's is another thing that, uh, yeah, you, you're. I don't think you'll find that any cheaper anywhere else. And um, people have heard me talk a lot about that. But anyway, so that maybe was the most I've ever had uh, regarding a trailer, and I love it so much. We're still going to get into Agatha all along. Episode three. After a quick break, we'll be right back. Agatha All Along, episode three, which I didn't write down the title, so I don't remember, but... I've got you. Robbie, once you tell me the title, kick us off. You start the discussion. Yeah. Where do you want to steer it first? Yeah, so this is Through Many Miles of Tricks and Trials, and oh, yeah. it's directed by Rachel Goldberg, uh, written by Cameron Squires. I... Loved this episode. Uh, and, and I've been excited for this one because it, on, on the one hand, there's not, there are a lot of things that I think you and I won't really be able to talk about fully until next week because yeah, correct. Uh, these uh, the three and four kind of pair a bit. And also, I just saw are both directed by uh, Rachel Goldberg. Which is, well, and I, I think that's a great place to start because those. 
The first two and the second two do, in my opinion, feel like a very clear, not left turn, a, a very clear, like different approach now. The first yeah. two, when you watch them the way we did, kind of a little more grounded. She's putting the team together. It's yeah. not on the witch's road. Directed more by Jack Schaefer, more WandaVision S, following up on those characters. And now we've gone into the road. You can't get out of the road. We're not seeing the WandaVision characters. It's mm -hmm. like this now feels tangibly different for multiple reasons, including the director. Yeah. And I, you know, when when Candace and I were were watching these, uh, the I think we both agreed that the third episode was our favorite I, for us. It, it, the, the series was just kind of going up. Uh, I I'm, I'm curious to, to revisit episode four and, and we'll talk about that next week. Cause it's, it's interesting that that's from the same director because that's the one that felt like a bit of a shift, but I don't want to really get into that yet. I just think it's interesting seeing that they're kind of paired up in the same way that one and two were. Um, but I, this is the part of the show that I think I was also kind of nervous about coming into it. Like the Westview stuff was, to me, I was a lot more comfortable with that. That's the safer bet. Yeah. And this, I just thought like, it it was a really fun way to get to know these characters pretty quickly. Like the, it was almost like Age of Ultron-esque, like in the way that you start seeing them separated and they're having these various like hallucinations and you're kind of getting a little bit of a peek into either their histories or like their fears and what's driving them and so i thought just as a third episode kind of continuing to set the table i thought it was really effective but i also thought it was really funny like some of the the stuff with mrs hart i thought was legitimately funny uh, at, at least early on, it starts to turn pretty dark towards the end. Mm -hmm. What what did you think about sh her dying, Sharon's dead? Um, there were people online saying last week, if you do anything to Mrs. Hart, I swear. And I was reading those going, uh oh. <laughs> Man, <laughs> we, I know. Like, and I'm so glad we can talk about that now. I, uh, I think I really, really like it just for the stakes being raised. Like you have yeah. to have some consequences because one of my critiques of uh, the witch's road eventually is just that like, I want it to feel, I want it to feel super, super intense and dark in, in that. Like they talk about how like no one survives it, blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah. And yeah. so like, if a person like Mrs. Hart can just ride along for the journey the whole time, yeah. it'd be like, how intense is this road? Like, this is just a random, you know, mom yeah. or yeah. house lady in Westview. That's just walking along doing it. Uh, it, so I think that I like the consequences being established here, but yeah. I think it will be shocking for some people. Yeah, I mean, I I also like the way that the the tri this first trial plays out because it feels it feels even there like they're in legitimate danger. Like I I like that it's not just it's not like just a puzzle. It, it is a puzzle, but it's like they are like, you can see them getting close to death and you can see that it's something that's like not even really like a matter of them being able to, to like power their way through it. Like even if they did have their powers, like I like that it's, it's, it's like a trial that Mrs. Hart can kind of participate in, even though ultimately it goes like very poorly for her. I but see what like, you're I, saying. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not like something where it's, it, it's not like Shang-Chi where suddenly you're like having Mrs. Hart, who is like a, a civilian learning how to do mystical things to get through this trial, which is where I think like it, it would start to get, which is not a dig on Shang-Chi. It's just like, that's a different approach that I think here would have felt like it, 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 it would have felt like a cop out. I wouldn't have felt consistent with the characterization of her in WandaVision and episode two. So I, I like both the way the trial was handled. Uh, I like the way that, that they blended the tension and the humor. And I do like the stakes of us losing her. Uh, I am a little bit... It, it is kind of a bummer to lose that character, not just because she's so funny, 
but also because like we talked about in the first two episodes, I think she's kind of a grounding force for the the for episode three, especially. She's like a I, big part of why the song works in episode two, for example. Yeah. She she can, yeah, it's like we said, she can kind of play the straight man a bit. And I do wonder if if that's part of what I miss getting into episode four. Uh, but I do think that that final shot here is such a great cliffhanger ending. And yeah, you know, we, we've always talked from day one, even with the Infinity Saga, that, you know, Marvel is sometimes afraid to, to yeah. kind of take the, the risks like that when it comes to character deaths. So I, I, can't, I can't really complain because this one I think was handled pretty well. Earlier I said mom. I didn't mean mom, by the way. I was just trying to say she's like a uh, a stay-at-home house lady, an older lady. <laughs> she, oh, we yeah. don't know that she's a mom, right? Technically. I don't think we yeah. do. Uh, um, and moms Gardner, are very though. strong. So I was not implying that they weren't strong. I was just <laughs> saying, you know, yeah, she's, she's, a, a she's not a witch. She's there. not a witch. <laughs> um, did she – this is dumb. Did she die because they didn't get the potion in time? Or the potion doesn't work for a non-witch. I think. Well, I it, guess it worked for the the teen. I so think it, it might be like it, the show made a point of showing how much more of the wine she was she drinking had too than everyone much. else. So I think that like it's it's like they all had like a particular dose, and I'm thinking maybe that's it. Like it's just well because the fact the, that, they still passed the trial even though she died. Like when they got the potion to her, that was the last thing for the trial to be complete. Yeah. But it didn't kill. It didn't save her. She still yeah. died. So yeah, it's probably just too much. You're right. Yeah, maybe they like they like checked the box technically, but they would have had to have give her given her because she did like she drinks. There's some glasses. Yeah. Like you you can, they make it clear that everyone else is kind of on the same page and that she has more. uh, I also, by the way, just like her, the entire premise of, of the house being this sort of like, like millennial, like Instagram influencer sort of a vibe. And that she just thinks it's like incredible. Like, you know, like Agatha thinks it's like, like, vanilla and lame and disgusting and mrs hart is just like what is it like bury me in this kitchen <laughs> yeah <laughs> they do <It's, laughs> yeah, yeah, true i didn't even think about that but i yep. thought like just that as a as a again i thought it was a really really perfect bridge between what i assume is going to be the first chunk of this show in westview and the next chunk of them like actually on the the witch's road I thought a highlight for me were the trials that they had to face individually and the nightmares. Um, just Which because, were scary. yeah, just because again, I'm looking for this witch's road to kind of live up to its name, and so stuff like that kind of took the correct turn. Yeah. For example, the face swelling thing was meant to be humor, and it is funny, but it's like okay, the witch's road just kind of like gives you giant pimples. That's not as funny to me. But then when it gets real serious because of the poisoning. That's yeah. just, I, I need that. I guess what I'm trying to say is I need that back half darker tone to bring back the beginning of the trial and make it all work for me, mm-hmm. um, which we'll talk about again next week. Um, the nightmares I thought in general worked fairly well. I mean, the one specifically of the crazy guy drowning the potion yeah. lady. Yeah. Pretty intense, actually. And I really like, that's a character that I, I got, I, I, we got so much more insight, uh, into her, like a little bit into her background, but also like, you know, the trial was clearly aimed at her specifically, like the, the, like and if is the that house be looked like, yeah. And she's like, oh, this looks like my clients, you know, like, uh, and, and then I kind of liked the way that like the the way that she came to the solutions, like the potions she needed to make and like what she needed. And like, I liked the way that she would describe things like, you know, like the yes, decomposed body of something that, that's millions of years old. <laughs> that was a highlight for me because it, it, again, it like was a wink at the camera for all of us about the witch stuff, like in the magic, right. like I need this and this, but like, where are we going to find that? Oh, it's in soap or whatever right. it was like. Yeah. And, and then, like, her using the big, like, you know, farm farmhouse sink 
as yeah, the cauldron. Yeah. And I actually didn't even like, I was just thinking like, oh, that's kind of like, that's fun. And whenever she has the realization, like, oh, wait, like, how do I heat this? And rich people use this little device to. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, I can't remember what it's called even. Uh, it's, <laughs> I'll remember it. I'll remember We're it. not the rich millennials, apparently. Sous, sous, <laughs> sous, sous, sous vide? Something like that. Um, but I love yeah, when I, you uh, fact Candace check cracked it. up at that because she actually knows how those work. But uh, yeah, I like all of that I thought was another example of it just feeling kind of like a, a like practical in a way. Like it all kind of made sense. I like that she wasn't just like immediately able to come up with this like insane potion and that like I, I like that it was kind of down to the last second but I like that we saw where they got each ingredient and like it's kind of saw her like stumped and trying to figure out what the the issue was at the end like agreed yeah I thought it was really well handled what do you think is like what do you think we learned about each of these characters uh, at least each each of the the witches oh, from this episode. That's fascinating. Why do you ask that? Do you think that each trial is supposed to be geared toward like a certain? A- I know it's geared toward the witch who like that was the potion one. I get that. Yeah, but like, is there supposed to be a life lesson from it too? Well, I just think that like the the hallucination stuff uh, is clearly whether it's something that's just a fear of theirs or whether it is actually going back to some scarring moment for them. Like, I think that that's Yeah, like, why, why did the potion lady see someone drowning her? She must have been physically abused by her I husband, I think that, maybe? like, that's how she, like, lost her, you know, became bound, like, lost her her power, was, like, and and maybe that's, like, part of, I, like I, I don't know. It's 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 almost like a, if you look at that, if that is the explanation, and then look at like what we see from Agatha, it is either like it's focusing in on like a, a like a traumatizing memory of theirs, but also like something that they have some like regret around, like a mistake that they made. Slash- was partially true, right? Like some of these memories are partially true, I think, right? Because yeah, the rocker I think girl so. sees her mom. I I could buy that that happened. Yeah. Well, it, it, that was one of my final two points. I have two final points. One of them is I think the most intrigued I am about the show, like the aspect of the show that I'm most intrigued by is uh, I said that horribly. The aspect of the show that most intrigues me mm-hmm. is this Agatha background thing because I I don't have any on her and this whole thing with this baby and claiming that she gave her son away for the dark hold, which yeah. would be so dark if true. And then that's partially her nightmare too, right? If I remember right here. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it's the potion, which lady, I need to learn her name that says, you mm-hmm. know, she gave her son away for the dark. Yeah. Hold. Yeah. And yeah. To, uh, to teen. Yeah. That's a conversation um, that happens there. Well, then my other point was, there's also a Mephisto reference. Did you catch yes, that? Yes. So yeah. I have no idea if that, that could just be Jack Schaefer, like totally mocking the WandaVision era stuff. If you remember Jennifer, that. Jennifer, by the way, I think is her, is her name. Okay. But Jennifer. Not the actress. That's Jennifer in the show. Jennifer in the show, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, that could like the Mephisto thing could just be a wink again, like the just a, a shout out to an era where yeah. we were all obsessed with Mephisto. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, um, I'm sure you could like Jack Schaefer would would get a kick out of that. But if there sure. was a show that was actually going to have some kind yeah. of Mephisto reveal, it'd probably be this one. And it does seem, I mean, they are talking about Mephisto as an entity, like a, as a person that exists. So I feel like even if they never show Mephisto in this show, I think it's kind of now been confirmed that there is such a character, you know, because I don't and, I, like, and uh, for Steve Rogers out there, for people who have no idea what we're talking about, Mephisto is like a devil type character, right? Yeah. That, that was referenced a lot during the WandaVision era. People theorized that he was behind all of it and it ended up yeah. being a total nothing burger, but Mephisto was such a, a key word because of this yeah. devil character. And now they're bringing it back. 
Well, and there is some like, there are, I, what makes me happy is I'm seeing some of that stuff get revived, like the, the WandaVision speculation and some of it carrying over from WandaVision, like Senior Scratchy is like, there's some interesting comics background stuff there uh, that they could be playing into. There's a, a character named Nicholas Scratch that is. Like, and, and, and we saw Nick in the first episode. Did you know that when she goes into her baby's room, her child's oh, room, it's Nick. I missed that. And then we know Senior Scratchy. So, I mean, I don't think that's much of a stretch. Yeah, it's in, in the comics. That is. So this is the interesting thing. In the comics, Nicholas Scratch is Agatha's son. OK, so they're so, clearly alluding to that. The question that kind becomes like, is Agatha's son team. And what happened and, in those in-between years? Yeah, like, I, I I feel like they are injecting enough kind of, they're confusing it enough in a good way to where you can't tell quite where they're going. And I'm almost like, I've avoided getting super into speculation until next week because I want us to kind of be on the same page with right. with viewers. But I I do think, like, yeah, they're definitely playing with that. I feel like every episode has one way or another... Well, and Teen has that stupid spell. So someone had yeah. to have cast that. Yeah. But yeah, what's the like what's the connection? And did she really it, give her child away? Where did he go then? If this if if Teen is her son, where did he go for whatever? 15 yeah. years? There's a lot of it, questions here. I mean, it, it yeah. Or is, it is or did she not get rid of her son and it's like a traumatized blacked out memory where her son died during something or something. And that's been like right. twisted in the lore. Cause it's all like, you know, it's like you're hearing these it's rumors like, you know, like Jennifer, yeah, how does she even have a son? Who's her, who's the guy in this situation? And when did that happen? Like, is that right, something that happened she's hundreds, like hundreds of years, of years old? ago? Well, if it's teen, then no, or, or maybe teen, if it, if it was her son would have the same aging, I well, and that, yeah, that's the other thing. It's like, we don't, and I, I like this, like, we don't really know how long Agatha had the dark hold, right? Like it could have been right before WandaVision. It could have been a hundred years ago. Like we know that, cause it's, it's not like she had, she didn't have it in the Salem flashback in WandaVision, right? I knew you were going to ask me that. Cause that's what I was thinking right now. I'm racking my brain. Listeners help us. Are we sure? I, like, why was she on trial again in those flashbacks in WandaVision episode? Well, uh, I seven? think it's because her power, separate and apart from the Darkhold, what makes her unique as a witch is that she can take other witches' power. And right, so, but I think, why was she in tri on trial? Because she because, had taken other. Yeah, because they were like, you've basically, like, you've, you've attacked other witches. Like, I think the idea is like you're not supposed to, like, that's, that's the breach is you can attack other people, but not other witches. And so I think like they then are going to punish her and put her to death for that. But then in doing so, just make her more powerful. So I don't feel like the dark, but, but again, what I'm not sure of is like, did she originally use the dark hold to unlock that ability? Or is that something that's just inherent to, to Agatha? I don't know. I don't know. You know, the other question I, I have, uh, and this is not really about this episode, but I, it's something that I've wondered since Multiverse of Madness. Is your understanding that there are, there is a dark hold for every reality, every universe, if you want to put it in that term, but there is only one book of Vishanti? Or is there also a book of Vishanti forever reality because I feel like whenever that gets destroyed by Wanda and Multiverse of Madness especially since it's like being held at this like nexus point between universes like I, I think the there's sense. only one book of Ashanti okay it's it's held outside of like a universe essentially yes okay um I don't think they would react so poorly if she had destroyed just one of infinite amounts. <laughs> yeah, because then they could have just gone <laughs> just go to, to another. a different one. Yeah. But I'm thinking about the dark hold because there's lots of dark holds. Uh, Christine says the dark hold was destroyed in every universe. And they say that again in 
Agatha. Like they mentioned several times, like every copy is destroyed. This is like trivia. If we did Marvel trivia, I'm trying to work. Yeah. Well, and then in, in the Westview library, those books are burned. That's because like what that was the Darkhold wasn't there in the library, was it? No, but I think that that's just part of her illusion. And I think that that's like her subconscious telling her that this is the book that because the, like the librarian says something to her like every like it was destroyed. Every copy was destroyed. And she's like, what? OK, another thing then. How much we talked about this a little bit last week. How much of last week was the illusion and what wasn't? Have you really wrapped your mind around that yet? Because I, I rewatched the first two episodes since we recorded that episode. Oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. Like the car thing, right? Was clearly like, okay, she thought she was like driving somewhere and it was all just in this spell. I think everything until she is naked is an illusion and everything after that. Was she not. actually ever working for the, the uh, police department as a detective? No. No, I think that she was, was going fake. around... She yeah, was just like I think walking like, around thinking yeah, that. Just like and right that's why when Herb says like, you've recently been in this like crime thing. It's weird. Yeah, like a true crime phase. So there was never actually a body. No, I don't think so. I think so it that's was all. not confirmation that Wanda's dead. It's just in her. She's like seeing that part of like the spell is dead. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that like, I think symbolically there's probably a lot like I need to think back to, to what everything is doing. Like, what it's all supposed to be a stand in for. But I do think that it's all like it's, it's her attempting, I think to like break free of it. And, and like, she's starting to see these things, but through the lens of like this spell that she's under. And I think then teen helps her finally actually break out of it. But yeah, I think everything like, like my understanding is that if it weren't the true crime, like probably before that, it was some other kind of like similar thing she was lost in, like the same way that uh, that Wanda was to some degree with the sitcom stuff. So like when this may be stupid, when Agatha arrests teen and then takes him to the police department, she probably just took him in his in her house. That's how. He yeah, because he's like bound closet. up in the closet. Yeah, right. So she probably just talked to him in the living room and then threw him in the closet at the end. Of yeah, it. which and so she's like, that's why she's like, okay, so me like bringing you into custody was actually just a kidnapping. I understand now. So like, I think, okay. yeah, in like the car, like the car desk, I think it's just showing it's it's Sorry, showing us. I, how, I was a little confused on all that. No, no, I think it's fair. Uh, I also think it would be a little bit. There's something about having put the first two episodes out together uh, that's kind of it's it's kind of confusing too because you see like like Aubrey Plaza's character like she's showing up in the illusion and here's something like one thing I'm still not totally sure of is like whether she was actually there talking to her I think she was but like because I guess that's the thing. I think maybe she's talking to all of her neighbors, but like in her illusion, Herb is like another cop. But really, she's maybe just like at the fence talking to him. Oh, yeah. And they walk to the backyard or something. So maybe like Aubrey Plaza's character like comes into the house and is trying to talk to her. And she's like, t from her perspective, just saying a bunch of nonsense. So she just plays into the cop role until she's out of it. And then we're just seeing it, she... all of it from Agatha's perspective. Yeah. If you saw it all from Aubrey Plaza's perspective, it'd be ridiculous. And it would be like kind of fun to see some of that. Uh, For sure. But I, I think, I think that was the point like, of the car. That, that was the yeah. point of the car shot. The car and him tied up in the closet is probably yeah, all we're going to show get. you how ridiculous it was. But yeah, so I. All right. That's what I, I had. I, I had a good week in the MCU this week. Dude, I yeah. had fun with this show, and I had fun with Thunderbolts. I mean, I, I just can't emphasize this enough. It's been fun, but we're about to get a lot more of... We're, we're about to enter a way more fun era. <laughs> and yeah. so we're just getting really close, and that's kind of dope. Again, don't forget you can get the merch I was talking about, the FFWpodcast.com. I'll ship it to you this week. Robbie, I thought... I thought it was good. Yeah, I thought episode two and three were kind of the highlights for me of our screener, but really the back half of two 
Yeah. Um, and then this third one, yeah, I agree. And I love how intense it ended. That's about all I had on my thoughts on episode three. You have anything else? Well, it, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, kind of moving into next week, just because I've kind of, I've, I've said that episode four was a step down for me, but I found out this week, uh, talking to Greg that, uh, apparently a lot of critics and I haven't read a lot of, a lot of the full reviews, you know, I saw like the Rotten Tomato score and stuff, but a lot of critics had the opposite reaction. Like I, apparently a lot of people thought episode four was really when it like took off. So it, it makes me really curious Hello. to see what our listeners are going to think. And I also just want, I want to say that to say like, keep an open mind. Like don't, I don't want people to think that I'm trying to like frame it poorly. I'm genuinely curious because yeah. that sometimes that just happens. Like there, there are things that don't work for me and they're like everyone else's favorite part. And that could be. Well, some week, stuff so. didn't work for me as well, but full disclaimer here, you and I have recorded these first two episodes ahead of time. Like we saw this episode, episode three, like a week right. and a half ago, but we're going to intentionally wait and be caught up with you guys next week, even though we've seen the fourth episode, just to give it another chance. You and I are both going to watch it again in real time, um, yeah. see if our opinion changed, see if now we've missed anything or caught something. Plus, it's just, it's been a while since we <laughs> watched yeah. it. So yeah, it, it, it'll it be interesting to see if a second watch for you in a different context changes that at all. And for me yeah. as well. For sure. And uh, yeah, I, I, this is, I, I like these moments because I'm curious to hear from our listeners on that and on what we've seen so far. Yeah. If you've got any comments or questions or things that you want us to discuss next week, uh, hit us up on our website or in the discord and we would be happy to, to chat. Thanks for listening. Thank you for supporting. We love you all. We'll see you next time on friends from work. Friends from work.